那那接下来就是连续三个 session 都跟 Open Source 有点关系。那现在我们就请到就是那个 Open Source 的 KDE Open Source 的 team lead， 他的那个 maintainer lead， 然后他来帮我们介绍 Lightweight KDE。那我们来欢迎 Will。Thank you everybody for coming.、Um, my name is Will Stevenson.、Um, as just been explained,、uh, I'm a member of the OpenSUSE team.、Um, I guess I'm the KDE team lead there.、Um, I've been working for SUSE for nearly eight years now.、Um, I've been working on KDE for eleven、uh, years now. I probably should. Find a new project and do something else, but I can't really make the change yet.、Um, but my name is Will, and I'm here to tell you about、um, a new way to package and present KDE, which I'm calling Clyde, which is lightweight KDE. So, who here uses KDE? Who knows what KDE is? Who doesn't know what KDE is? Nobody doesn't know what KDE is. Okay, that's good. Then we can continue.、Um, so,、um, KDE is the oldest full-featured、um, free desktop environment,、um, originally for for Unix workstations, but now it's on practically any kind of computing device you can、uh, you can lift, and some you can't lift. Uh, and as a result,、um, KD recently、um, recently celebrated its sixteenth、uh, birthday, I believe, this year, and so, or will do in September. Sixteenth birthday. There is a lot of code in the KDE project. So, what do you think about when when you think about KDE? What have you heard about it? Well, you might have heard of this guy. He's a he's a very large gorilla. It's Got millions of lines of source code, hundreds of applications, thousands of contributors. Features that, if I go to a KD conference, I find about new features that I never used yet. And you might think, is this more desktop than I really need? We have a saying in in English. It's called、uh, "everything but the kitchen sink." And that means if you're going on a trip and you have a really big bag with everything in it, the only thing that's not in it is the sink, kitchen sink. Well, people have said that KDE actually has the kitchen sink because it has so many features.、Uh, you have full PIM suites for email and calendaring and contacts. You have semantic desktops. You have office suites. You have database management tools. You have system management tools. You have instant messaging. You've got blogging. You've got social networking. You've got everything there. And often, when you install、um, KDE as part of、uh, a Linux distribution, part of my work, you really get everything that is going there immediately. And、so、people say, "Well, does KDE have a design philosophy?" And if it does. It must be some kind of maximalist one, where you have every possible tool that you could possibly need on the desktop, and sometimes that can be confusing. And then finally, our least favorite criticism is KDE bloated. This is a puffer. This is a, a, a puffer fish, a big blown-up fish with lots of air inside it, and it's not very useful. It's cute though. So, who here agrees with these kind of feelings when they think about KDE? Yeah, one guy over there. He's, a, he's not using KDE anymore. <laughs> Maybe I can change his mind. Maybe I can tell、um, the rest of you some things that might make you want to、uh, use KDE and recommend KDE to your friends. Ah,、uh, we went back. Well, what if there was another way? And、um, Here we have a, a large fish being filleted, and it's a kind of a messy,、um, a messy operation. And you know that after you finish taking the good bits out of the fish, there's no way you're going to be able to make it back into a fish again. <laughs> so, instead, I'd like to try and present a way that we could make KDE lighter, in a more structured way. Look at these building blocks. One of the things that KDE has that is a real strength,、um, that 
maybe you don't know about when you look at KDE as a user and you read about people posting on forums, people comments, people um, flaming KDE when we make a new release, is that KDE has a really, really strong architecture. Um, if you want to learn how to make a multi-million line software project that works well, uh, you should look at the KDE source code and the KDE architecture. KDE is based in many ways on a very high degree of efficiency. Things like um, configuration files, which would normally take a lot of, uh, which are stored in text, unlike the Windows registry, under, unlike the, uh, the GNOME uh, D and GCOM systems, um, stored as text, so very easy for people to edit um, and very robust, um, but expensive to pass. So those are efficiently passed into, uh, into a binary format and, ca and made available um, at runtime through some very efficient APIs. Or, for example, loading shared libraries. Now, maybe um, 10 years ago on Linux, uh, a loading a shared library, relocating all those symbols was a very expensive operation. And especially in an object-oriented um, language like C++ with Qt on top of it, you had a very large shared library. So loading those symbols could be get expensive. So sharing code had a cost. And KDE, more than 10 years ago now, pioneered a solution to um, get around the cost of loading shared libraries by loading all of the shared libraries once and then forking off the um, processes from this single launcher process and that reduces the cost of that shared library relocation to nothing. Now, that has become a lot cheaper in uh, current versions of uh, the new standard linker, but it's still, a, it's still an effect. Um, also think about code reuse. I was talking to PC Man last night, and he said that the, the, the common denominator in LXD is quite low. There are... are um, the shared factors are quite small at the moment. Um, starting with KDE 2, these kinds of factors were recognized and put into shared libraries. So KDE now talks about not just being KDE, but it's the KDE, the KDE platform and the KDE libraries that build on that platform, and the KDE workspace that build on that platform. And they're sharing all that code, um, all that functionality. So it's a very high level platform which makes it very easy to write an application. And then KDE in the environment is very highly modular. Um, many components can be replaced, can be disabled or optional. And those, couple, uh, those components are loosely coupled, which means that it's easy to take those out or replace them without causing side effects. The interfaces are well-defined and the, um, the, the optional components are designed so that when they're removed, they don't cause um, negative side effects um, to the desktop environment. And as I said, there, y there are many optional features in KDE 4 or KDE. So my approach to these criticisms that KDE is a big, heavy desktop environment is a project which I've called Clyde in a rather uh, arbitrary naming. And the philosophy of this is that we start with um, just enough KDE to provide a recognizable desktop environment. We then make it possible to uh, add back any of these optional components which are not in present by default. So I haven't just, like the guy making a fish, I haven't just uh, filleting a fish, I haven't just taken a knife to it and chopped them off and disabled them permanently. Um, and making them optional so you can add them back in so you get the features you need. So these are the steps which I've taken for the basic method to get to what I call a uh, Clyde basic uh, installation. We take, um, and this is going to annoy my friend Paul in the second row here, we take the first step of uh, disabling and removing the uh, PIM middleware layer. So that means um, there's a database server which uh, acts as a PIM service for emails, for contacts, for calendar details, if you need them, that's running there. Um, and we can turn that off. There's also a file indexer. Now that is a really useful tool if you have a big hard disk and you want to say, oh, where's my file, um, which 
I sent on the 3rd of January by email as an attachment, you have very powerful querying abilities and that can search that, that can answer your question about the contents of your huge hard disk very quickly if you index it. Has a small cost when it's running though. Um, we turn off the semantic desktop which um, gives you the ability to store all kinds of metadata and make high level queries about your metadata so you can say show me all the photos which I raised which I gave three stars to a three star rating on my photos or more when they're saved on my disk or something. Um, then we have uh, the KD activity system which is a way to uh, have projects on your desktop which combine related programs, related data, um, related windows so you can Instead of doing session management where you say save this session and you log out, you can keep a session, say, of all your, uh, your communications activities or some work project A or a different work project B and you can keep all those things together. But we turn those off and then we uh, disable what are called runners which are pop-up dialogue and you can then type in commands and get those evaluated on the, on the, in a pop-up dialogue in a very easy way, I'll show you that later. And then we turn off any e extraneous session services which are um, programs without a graphical user interface which do things in the background which Kate, you might need to use. And then, what do we do? What does, what, how can we go beyond that? If you want to really save memory then you start cutting things back that actually make an obvious difference. So. We could use a simpler desktop theme. The desktop theme provides this very pretty transparent gradients, shadows, look and feel. Now if you, if you use a simpler theme that, um, regis that renders to simpler data in the X server and that saves memory. You can use simpler panel widgets. Instead of using a um, complex menu, you can use a simple uh, pop-out menu. And you can then also turn off compositing in the window manager, which is called desktop effects in KDE. So, how much can we actually save here? From cutting back on all of these features, um, I've got the figure in the top row, which is uh, 124 megabytes, roughly, give or take, um, of memory. That's for uh, full all the um, user processes in the KD session. That's 120 megabytes. Um, by comparison, a well, I'll come on to I'll come back to that later. So you see there, the big things there, the really big things are Akonadi, the PIM middleware. That's um, 75 megabytes, which is a basic um, middleware without, any, without actually adding any emails to it or uh, any accounts. That's just when it starts up and is running. Um, the semantic desktop has a separate database, which also consumes 64 megabytes with its runtime when it's running. Uh, activities 10, compositing about 11, and the other things are all under 10 megabytes. But maybe that's too much data for you. So let's let's just uh, sim have we got any managers in the audience, or are you all students? Here's, here's, a manager. Here we go. here's the manager version, a, a pie chart. Uh, now the contrast from where I'm standing isn't great, but if we look at the, um, of this is an entire session, and this seg segment here in the medium blue is what you can get down to with a basic, basic cut down without um, with cut turning off everything. If you, if you ha then add the, keep the basic services compositing and the uh, normal widgets that you have, then it comes back up to here to this green segment. But it says that a good, um, nearly uh, m more than 50% of the of the default consumption can be um, disabled if you want to, to do so. And finally, do we have anyone who's, who's who's above a manager? Anyone? Any really senior guys here? You'll understand this. You'll be. A, I know you've been sitting there. You've been confused as hell. <laughs> but that's how much memory we save. So a default session of KD4 um, comes in about 300 megabytes. Um, I've actually seen it higher than that on some reviews. I've seen figures judging going between 380 and 700. I really don't know what those guys were smoking. 
um, on OpenSUSE, it comes in, uh, OpenSUSE 12.1, it comes in about 305, 310. There's some variability there. But more than half of that I'm getting, I can do away with. So let's um, just go over to a quick demo. And where is my... Hold on, guys. No. So this is a cloud session. It's what I call the the, the basic session. So we've instead we've got the instead of the default kickoff menu, we've got this kind of traditional menu. You'll see the menu is very empty because there's very little software installed. There isn't even a console. There isn't even a, a Dolphin file manager there which doesn't make any difference to the memory footprint, but it really means that you only start with the apps that you need. And I'm actually running Xterm here because I haven't got console installed. And there you see the running figure there is um, 125 memories, um, yeah, megabytes of memory. Okay, it's now got up to 137. I don't know what I was doing there, but it was 125 when I booted this machine. Um, and that's almost as low as you can go without really cutting things down. Um, you could change the wallpaper as well. That would save some memory as well. Um, you could run fewer widgets here, but I've got the basic widgets. I've got your notifiers, got devices. I've got a, a pager, so you can switch between virtual desktops. Got some launches, got a task map bar. That's everything that a very simple desktop would do. Um, and yep. Compositing is actually enabled in that, so you've got your, your transparency you see there. Um, you've got all your desktop effects, things pop up with animations. It's a modern desktop and it's running in um, just over 100 megabytes of memory. Now, this virtual machine that you see here is running uh, with one single core um, and with one gigabyte of memory. Um, I've also um, as an experiment, I've been booting this machine with only 256 megabytes of memory um, and with the CPU limited to 800 megabytes, uh, megahertz, which is, it's not a perfect model of a very slow system because it's still an i7 CPU, it's a high performance CPU. Um, you can't disable those features very easily, but it's a good approximation of a slow system and the system remains perfectly usable because it really is a desktop, a window manager, a panel and a launcher and that's in 125. So going back to the presentation, is there anything else that anyone would like to see, uh, see test in that while I'm here? Okay, let's go back to the slides. So why might you want to use a light, lightweight KDE? Um, who really uses, an, who just uses a browser here? You use Gmail, you use Facebook, you use Twitter, yeah, it's hand up over there, you just use browser, you don't need anything more than that. <laughs> or if you're a business wanting to address a, a vertical market, so you're making uh, like a kiosk, like a, a, in, a embedded system in a kiosk, or uh, say something like in a, a web um, internet cafe, then you've got only what you need there with a web browser. And that's there, and that's installing straight away out of the OpenSUSE build service. Um, or for fix, fixed function workers who run one particular application, it might be in a web browser, it might be some, some custom application, that's there already. Um, it might be for education uses where children might be confused by having too many applications. Or uh, where you have school children who you don't want them to be able to like, I don't know, um, format disks using uh, the disk utility or um, send messages to each other using instant messaging. Um, it might just be for the power user who really knows what he wants and what he doesn't want and wants to start with the bare bones and add everything he wants. The great thing about Clyde is all of the things that I cut down to get you that 120 megabytes footprint system are um, replaceable. So that pie chart, you can build it back up to the, um, up to the full system if you want. Or for beginning users like children, as I said, 
who you want them to learn how to use a real desktop because that's what people use in a lot of places, but you don't want them to be confused by starting a lot of different applications. So you have the bare, num bare minimum stuff installed. How did I do that? Well, um, there's no magic here. It's just really knowing how things fit together and which things you can take out and which things you have to leave in. But in order to make things optional and still guarantee that the system works if you put them back in, um, means that you need to be able to have soft dependencies between modules, between components, so that you know that if you remove, um, if you keep component A and you remove compo components B and C, but B and C depend on each other, that if you install B that you get C as well. And these are soft dependencies because B and C can be removed, whereas hard dependencies say that A cannot be removed. These weren't very well supported until recently, but now they're, um, now they are uh, present again. In so we have three levels of dependencies. Requires is strongest, recommends is weaker, suggests is, also is the weakest. We also package configuration files. So um, the uh, disabling of certain um, features which are installed is just part of a configuration package which can be removed or added with the package manager and that changes policy. And you can have alternatives yeah. of this configured package configuration to reconfigure the system. So. You could do this just as well, the Gen 2 system. You could compile the things that you need and leave out the things you don't need. But it's very hard to reproduce a Gen, Gen 2 system um, on different hardware, unless you go and image the disk, and then it won't, might not work on different machines, different drivers. So by using the, build, the OpenSUSE build service to create these custom packages, um, this is a, a regular RPM packaging that you can install on a minimal installation of OpenSUSE. So as I um, want to make you to believe that I'm not just tricking you and uh, pulling the wool over your eyes, I'll explain a little bit about the method that I used. It is hard to measure memory usage on Linux accurately. Um, Linux shares memory between applications very well. And that means to actually see how much memory is being used by any application, it's easy to ca overestimate because you count the shared memory. The default tools count the shared memory once for each application that's using it. Now, better tools take the memory used privately by the application and then they add on the shared memory and then divide each p shared component by the number of applications that are using that shared component. And that's the call that proportional shared size rather than resident set size. And that gives you a better estimate <coughs> of, um, of where, where the memory is going. And that also um, accurately changes if you stop running services, whereas if you just count the RSS, then you don't actually see any saving if you stop, stop a service. Um, also, people often say, hey, I've got no free memory under Linux. Well, that's because Linux is caching all the libraries it ever loaded and is no longer using for later usage. That's useful. And finally, um, PixMaps, as so graphical data allocated by um, user programs, um, by default appears under the X or the X server's memory um, usage, which uh, is also confusing because that you don't see the memory go up. And it, I've been talking only about the memory used by user processes, but if you use um, the KD system monitor to measure your memory usage, it will. And um, it will see exactly how much uh, X memory is allocated and show it in the user process which is using it. So I also might want to anticipate some of your criticisms. You might say, well, if you buy a netbook, um, so a cheap netbook in, uh, in Europe costs about um, 200 to 300 euros, um, comes with one gigabyte of memory, has 200, 300 megabytes of hard disk. And that's far more than the kind of savings which I'm talking about. So what's the point? Well, if you have stuff that's installed on your disk and you're not using it, um, then it's something that's got to be maintained. It's something that's got to, that could be used uh, as an attack against you, uh, against the system. So you might as well do without it. And also it makes your installation an awful lot faster. And then the other criticism, which is harder to avoid, is saying, well, all these features serve users, so why not keep them running? But the guy in the corner using the browser for all his tools, he doesn't need that PIM stack 
He doesn't need that database server that's providing semantic services. Um, he probably just has control and tab to switch between tabs in Chrome. He doesn't really need activities. So it's not serving anyone, and it's using CPU all the time in small amounts, but it all adds up. So where would I like to go next with Clyde? At the moment, it's a, a, a project in the OpenSUSE build service. Um, it, you can install it by taking OpenSUSE 12.1, taking a minimal installation, adding this project and installing its packages using the tools. I would like to make a, an ISO image, which makes it very easy to test and demonstrate. Um, I would like to add more packages which contain different configuration policies, so you can change the things that get started just by changing packages. It makes it easy to set up a default system from via, for admin. Um, for power users, I'd like a tweaking configuration GUI, which means you can just turn on and off all these services in one place. We could explore split, splitting packages up further so that um, you could say exactly, I want, so look, there's the krunner dialog there. We have a lot of different command line runners. But on this system, they're all active, but you might want to say, well, we split out the um, calendar stuff, for example, into a separate, we know nobody's going to use that. I think at this point, the law of diminishing returns applies because you're only saving maybe about five megabytes um, of disk space. These things are very small anyway, but it's possible. We could also look into performance more closely than I have done so far. Um, I haven't demonstrated it, but um, booting the minimal system I showed you earlier, the login to desktop takes about eight to 10 seconds versus about 30 seconds for a full login. So there are probably a lot more performance changes that could be made there. Um, hasn't been my focus yet. And finally, I think that this work is going to inform the work towards KD5, which is called KD Frameworks 5. And that's all about modularization and component componentization and further defining the interfaces between KD um, components so that you can make a more um, targeted installation of KD. And I think that this, doing this with the KD4 shows that this is work is proceeding in the right direction. So if you want to find out more, note down this URL, bit.ly jtd1eq, and that is the link to the OpenSUSE build service project where you can get these packages, and as I work on this project, I will extend this information on that link. So thank you for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I would like to ask why uh, you removed the, the Dolphin file managers from the demonstration just now because I was wondering if there, there are any file managers that is more lightweight than Dolphin or it, you are doing it in assumption that the user doesn't need file management. Thank um, you. That wasn't a very strong decision on my part not to install it. Um, I just um, did the installation by saying install the KD workspace package with none of the soft requirements, and the Dolphin file manager is one of those soft requirements. But um, on other installations that I've done, I've done that, and then I've installed um, the console KD terminal because it's a lot nicer than Xterm, and I've installed Dolphin again. But I think Dolphin's a great file manager. It's not particularly heavy. There are much more lighter weight alternatives. The uh, PC Man, of course, and um, the, uh, the other lightweight desktops of course, then you don't have such good integration with KDE because the virtual file systems are different, but if you're doing this, you probably aren't too bothered with that. Okay? PC man. Okay, this is going to be good. <laughs> okay, uh, th thank you for the presentation. It's quite impressive. Uh, I, I have some more detailed question about internal of KDE because uh, uh, actually I take some time to, to study how KDE works and uh, I found there are many background processes running running there uh, including uh, there is one process constantly re rebuild a cage uh, including a, a large binary cage for, for the desktop entry files and the installed applications and, and and other process which I, I don't know what they are doing yeah 
but okay. is there uh, is it possible to to reduce the amount and uh, uh, of these uh, services and 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 about the file manager and uh, when when I uh, open Dolphin file manager, uh, it actually uh, launched a lot of background processes uh, along with it. Some some may be related to the KIO slave, but okay. yeah. Um, so this, these are the user processes running in this system here. Um, at the moment, there are no IO slaves running because um, the uh, IO slave launcher um, kills idle IO slaves after some time. So I think it's not a bad thing if you have IO slaves running. These IO slaves perform virtual file system functions. Um, then they're, if they're there, then they're doing something. Um, otherwise, they'll be killed. What else can we see there? We can see um, KRunner, which provides the Alt F2 pop-up. KDD4 is the service manager, and that saves a lot of memory because it runs modules, which are things like um, check, like if the system host name changes, uh, if the network status notifying those changes. KglobalXL and KAccess provide accessibility functions, so that can be turned off. So, uh, you know, if you hold down shift key for five seconds, then that's the accessibility function that says, do you want to have, um, do you want to have sticky keys and bounce keys? Global Excel is a daemon which is useful because it allows global acceleration to work. Thank you. Um, I'll just finish this. Um, the notifications could also be turned off. That does system um, play sounds and pops things up. Policy kit is useful for a privileged access, but could be turned off if you how, if you know your user won't need privileged access. Um, KUI server pops up dialogues. Um, Extern bash, vbox, dbox, daemon, you can't get rid of those. Start KDE is the script which starts all of KDE. And start KDE and KWrapper 4 are both parts of this process which start KDE programs using shared memory and preloaded libraries. So they're, they're kind of not part of it. Um, but the things that you mentioned, the, the, the build Psycocker process, that's not running now. That only runs, it watches the install directories and it only runs when those directories change. It doesn't run all the time. So it's not there now. So out of that process, I could, if I wanted to get very aggressive, maybe remove four processes. And the second half of that list Half of that is due to running VBox to demonstrate this. But we can talk about it in more detail. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'll be here for the next tomorrow as well and the rest of today. If you have any questions, please come up and I will show you some more or whatever else.